Video recordings of this podcast can be found on RaisingEquity.org and Raising Equity on YouTube. Welcome to Raising Equity. Today, we're going to focus in on abortion. You've, I'm sure, heard about the domino effect of states passing different bans around abortion rights, but we're going to talk about the broader issues, abortion rights, abortion access, reproductive justice. And today I have with me Pamela Merritt, who is co-founder and co-director of ReproAction. And I'm really appreciative that you were able to join us on such short notice, given all the news and everything going on. So thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about ReproAction and, and the organization? It's just four years old, right? Four years old. We founded in July of 2015. And my co-founder, Aaron Matson and I um, basically had a lot of discussion before deciding to found an organization together about what was going wrong in the reproductive health rights in law um, and justice movement. So we determined that we were losing, Mm -hmm. that we needed to infuse a culture of direct action in the movement again, and that we were the people we were looking for. So we've co-founded ReproAction, which is a direct action organization that works to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. Awesome. And so four years ago, you were clear that we were losing. Mm -hmm. And tell me a little bit about how you saw the losses coming. Because I think for Mm -hmm. some folks, they're feeling like right now, they're feeling the loss and and feeling frantic and, and really anxious. But you were clear long before today, long before now, 2019, that we're losing. Yes. So you know, both of us had worked in reproductive rights for a while and had been activists for quite some time. Uh, And I had worked previously for the statewide Planned Parenthood Advocates in Missouri. Um, I cut my teeth on a lot of public policy and um, in that kind of uh, advocating on behalf of healthcare provider, Planned Parenthood. And the reality is that we were celebrating compromises victory. Mm. And that is not an indictment um, so much of, of the hard, amazing work that advocates have done for the last 46 years to try and, and increase and maintain access to abortion and reproductive health care. But a couple of factors were were tumbling together to make it really um, a series of losing and in, in trying to rebrand those losses as some kind of victory. So making compromises and perpetuating stigma about abortion. Um, anytime we were talking about abortion, we were always saying, well, it's only 3% of what we do. They don't do that so much anymore, but it, years of saying that perpetuated the stigma that abortion is something wrong. Um, we, we applauded politicians for doing the bare minimum. You know, if you're an endorsed politician and you receive money from an organization on behalf of uh, advancing reproductive rights and, um, and protecting abortion access, voting against defunding bills is your job. It's not a major accomplishment. You haven't cured some major thing <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and you haven't actually taken a particularly brave stand. You've done your job and we should be we should appreciate that. But um, but the over the top enthusiastic um, party throwing for that set the standard that we really had low expectations of our political leaders. Mm. And then um, the the movement's loudest voices, the big national organizations were, um, for uh, to put it as plainly as possible, they were not inclusive. Um, they did not listen to, respect, um, or appreciate the leadership of black women um, and women of color. And uh, as a result, um, they were tailoring their messaging without us at the table and often then bringing us in after the fact to try and say, okay, so this is what we've decided to do. And, you know, I'm, I'm a founding member of the trust black women partnership. And I, when I say trust black women, I mean it (laughs) because we, you know, we have to be a part of those dialogues and those conversations. So way too much of this movement work was happening separate of black women organizing and was not, it was not inclusive. It was not welcoming. And, um, and the result was that it, it lacked the brilliance and magic that we bring to political work. 
And you mentioned that stigma too, the, the narrative around abortion of, I think it was Alyssa Milano said recently, well, you know, no one wants to have an abortion. Uh, and it's mm-hmm. like, actually, actually, there's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with choosing an abortion. Mm-hmm. And there are times when you might want an abortion. And so how do you respond to that, that narrative that like, oh, no one would want it. How do you respond to the stigma? I reject it 110%. Um, I, I like to tell um, groups when I'm speaking to them that um, it's a little bit like those friends we all had growing up who would eat something particularly nasty and then say, this is gross, taste it. So, and you, you know, you're never going to want to taste it. So abortion is great. Abortion is healthcare. Abortion is safe. Abortion is something that many, many people want. And it is not for a lot of people, um, they view it as a relief. And in all of the polling that we've seen, very few people regret their abortion. Um, And when we start getting into the numbers of the people who regret it, they might have regretted the circumstances under which they had an abortion, but they do not regret having access to the care. So we need to celebrate abortion as as a positive, necessary um, element of reproductive health care. Um, and I reject stigma 110 percent when people say, are you pro-abortion or nobody's pro? I'm, I'm pro-abortion. Absolutely. I wouldn't be doing this work. Um, since 2007, <laughs> if I weren't pro-abortion, and I am un- unapologetic about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the fact that it is a part of the broader reproductive justice work, mm-hmm. right? And so when we over-focus on abortion and the stigma of abortion, we miss all other aspects of reproductive health that need to be discussed. So what are some of those issues that we need to be discussing? And of course, we'll get back to abortion. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, um, so many. So access to birth control and um, and making it affordable and something that people can easily access both with transportation or maybe delivery at their home. We have we actually had a study out of Washington University in St. Louis that um, provided free birth control and transportation to participants. And what they found, this was released many years ago at least three years ago. And what they found is that it increased people staying on birth control and not missing pills or whatever their their chosen method was. So we know that birth control, when people can access it, helps people make decisions and plan their, their reproductive future. And we need to work on making it more accessible. We're not. If anything, we have the Trump administration and other political figures, particularly in um, what we call the Midwest and Upper South regions, mm-hmm. um, restricting access to family planning um, through uh, cutting funding for Planned Parenthood or even Title X um, funders. So it's, it's, it's a crisis, and it's only going to get worse, that people who, are, who do not have birth control coverage through their insurance provider are struggling to access care, and that is not good. Um, and I, we also need to build a greater understanding of what birth control is. When we talk about hormonal therapy, um, we have a lot of people who struggle with endometriosis, with fibroids, who are not having access to care because we aren't focused on those, on those issues which actually ha- can have a devastating impact on people's fertility. Mm. Um, women of color and black women Um, have an increased likelihood of having fibroids or endometriosis, and access to hormonal therapy can be an important treatment plan. So when we talk about not covering the pill for lots of folks, that's not covering the thing that makes it possible for them to have children in the future. Um, We need to talk about um, uh, stigma and lack of protection and care for people who are trans, um, for the LGBT community in general, and specifically for people who are trans, who struggle to get in and get pap smears, who um, we just saw the Trump administration issue directions that allow for people to discriminate against, um, allow for medical professionals, I should say specifically, to discriminate against people based upon that, that professional's religious conviction. What that translates into is people who are already struggling to get respectful care having an even harder time to do so. And nobody who has taken an oath to provide, to be a doctor or a nurse should ever deny care to somebody um, because of who they are, 
because of who they are. Um, we need to work on that. And we're not um, focused on that when we're focused on abortion restrictions and public public officials who spend weeks figuring out how to um, ban abortion or deny access to birth control really need to think about how health um, has a negative, a bad health policy has a negative impact on their communities. Um, you know, insulin is being rationed by people in this country. We have um, folks who have children with asthma who can't afford that medication. EpiPens are both out of people's cost range and, and not available at pharmacies. Um, there are major things that folks can focus on. And for repro action, we are hyper-focused on infant and maternal mortality. Um, in the states where we have organizers on the ground, Missouri, Virginia, Arkansas, Wisconsin, and New York City, we have an incredible range of, of infant and maternal mortality rates that are the worst in the developed world and are unacceptable and certainly not reflective of communities that value life. Yes, yes. And I wanted to make sure that we opened up the conversation so people understand that it's it's not just about abortion and that reproductive justice is so much more than that. And if, if folks are really pro-life and concerned about life, mm-hmm. they would also be taking these other things into consideration, right? So just like you mentioned around the pill and being able to protect uh, a woman's ability to have children in the future. If you cared about life, you would make that accessible so that they could. But it's not about life. It's about control. It's about power. It's right? about it's about control and power. So this is a weird Pamela Merritt yes. activist um, thing. But I I've heard so many organizers and so many national groups talk about how these these folks want to control women's bodies or you know, to use more inclos- inclusive language, they want to control people who can who have uteruses or who have can have pregnancy, experience pregnancy. And as a, as a longtime reproductive justice activist, I firmly believe that we need to name it to defeat it. Okay. And this is about white supremacy. This is about people who want to control people who experience pregnancy for a reason. They want certain women to have more babies. And they want other women to either have babies to serve the purpose of service or some sort of labor or not to have babies. And when I look at our in our immigration policies, when I look at our incarceration policies, when I look at how we're destroying public education and we're we're gutting the environment, but we are also creating an environment where it's harder for people to access birth control. This is a pattern that has been continued throughout history. And what I see is an, an overt attempt to establish and maintain a certain dominant white population. And I've actually even seen um, people slip and say it in public, you know, really? Paul Ryan did. He was at a conference before he left office and he was talking, he was introducing Kellyanne Conway at a conference and he bragged about the fact that I, you know, he was talking about abortion, but he was talking about it in the population control. It's like, I've done my duty in having a lot of kids. It's these other people who aren't having our kids, you know, and Kellyanne doubled wow. down on that, you know, and Trump has certainly been overt in, in that language. And those who follow him are hearing that. He's not saying that just for, um, for, for kicks. He's saying that because that, that language resonates with folks who fear their population being pressed upon. Hmm. I appreciate you bringing that into the conversation because these things don't happen in silos. Oppression does not happen in silos and white supremacy touches so many aspects of our society that sometimes we people say, oh, it's a women's issue. Well, actually, no, it's more complicated. And mm-hmm. in preparing for this interview, I was feeling like, oh, I need to understand how we got here and was watching a documentary on Netflix around reimagining Roe and reading and talking to folks. And I didn't realize that historically abortion was something that that Republicans were actually for, right? Like nowadays we see we uh, we assume Republican conservative and maybe even conservative Christian pro-life like we put we conflate those yet historically 
I learned that Reagan, as governor of California, like was pro-abortion reform to try to make it more accessible for folks. And and that in the way the Republican Party is about, you know, low interference and individuals lives, small government. And so it would make sense that they would say you get to choose to do with what you want with your body. But yet here we are. Yes. Yes. With guns having more rights than people who experience pregnancy. Um, it's, it's fascinating, but I, that's one of the reasons why I like to point out the white supremacy angle, because the only thing that has small government fiscal conservatives, um, pulling that kind of hypocritical pivot is the fact that they see the benefit of it to, to population domination. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that one of the reasons why, um, people are nervous about conservatives who who do actually talk about um, birth control or population control is a history of that um, being used against people who are disabled or undesirable populations, black people. Sterilization. Yes, exactly. In in many cases, all the way into the eighties. So when I think about it, um, that's one of the reasons why I naturally gravitated to reproductive justice, because you, you, even within the the left or progressive spaces, there's a tendency to talk about what needs to happen for other people. And in reality, as an activist, I want people to have information because that's power. And I also want people to be able to determine whether or not to parent, to have the supports to parent if they choose to do so, and that that shouldn't be something that we look at as some people are worthy of and other people aren't, Uh, you know, our society would be much stronger if people had support and if they were respected in their decisions. And then obviously to be able to raise their families in environments that are free of violence and oppression. So I think um, the, the fear has always been that the same Republicans who are casually accepting children in cages um, might be motivated to, um, to push long acting reversible contraception, what we call LARCs for bad means for, you know, for not for good purposes, but on populations that they see as, as a drag on society. So there's that balance between um, our need to dismantle the, the white supremacy and that oppression, even as we advance these policies. Mm -hmm. And that was something I know that in the, documentary they were really trying to make that connection uh between kind of the conservative uh evangelical christian and uh seg- even racial racially segregated spaces and the like pivot to the pro life movement mm-hmm. and i'm not going to do it justice but i encourage folks to watch it right but it was it they were they didn't name it as white supremacy but they they pointed out that there was a pivot and it was a pivot at a point where, where a lot of the religious organizations were segregated mm-hmm. where, where, and openly wanted to be all white and were working to kind of marry the conservative values with the Republican party. And some of the language that was being used is very similar to the language that's being used now. And again, I, I'm not in the reproductive world, so that's why I wanted to have you here to talk about it. To me, it's important to, for folks to understand the broader landscape and the history because people are freaking out like this is new, like, oh my gosh, this could happen. But this is not new. No. <laughs> no. Uh, this is, it, in, in many ways, it predates Roe. So, you know, one of the things my nerdy brain first latched on to when I started doing this work, I said that you can really explore the history of the United States of America in terms of who, um, who was desirable to have children and who it wasn't desirable to have children and, and what the government was willing to do to decrease or increase um, those populations. So you, uh, we have had um, all kinds of atrocities that have been policy against um, uh, indigenous people, against uh, Africans brought here in, in slavery, against indentured servants. Were there limits put on? Of course. Okay, I'm yeah. not familiar. Can you tell folks a little yeah, bit? Yeah, there, there's, um, there's language that, well, we, we both had the issue of people taking away children yes. from indigenous populations um, and forcing them to present in a more... Um, 
a white or right. mainstream white kind of way. We would call in our my field it's deculturalization, mm-hmm. right? Like to take them away and it, to try to take their culture away from them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, that history is is horrific. We have issues of, you know, offering certain populations um if if you're incarcerated, we've had recent incidents of people being offered um uh parole or no jail time if they agree to be um, for long-term sterilization. Um, We have uh, some folks who are prosecuted for self-managing their abortion outside of a medical setting. Other people aren't um, for all of the reasons. We have um, forced sterilization uh, issue that happened in California in its prison um, prisons. We had and that's still happening now, yeah. right? People think about that as in the mm-hmm. past. No. But these sterilization deals that you're talking about are recent, right? Recent, like within the last five years. And then you have the history, what, what really bothers me is like you have the early 1900s where people talked about Irish immigrants and Italian immigrants much the same way. Yep. We are currently talking about um, migrants and people who are trying to get... Um, get asylum coming up from South America. So it's the same horrible language. It's the same disgusting dehumanization yes. of the of them. But within that, there's also this, once you've established that this isn't a person, all manner of atrocity that can be done to them. We know for a fact that um, the current Department of Homeland Security has been charting the menstrual cycles of women who are being held in detention centers. Seriously? Yes. They have been um, experimenting with um, what they call what is a completely thoroughly untested and medically um, medically ch- questionable um, uh, abortion pill reversal where and they have blocked people accessing abortion. They are they are uh, unashamedly um talking about how they want to make sure that they're testing out stuff on people who don't have and are not being given their full human rights. So it, there, this is without consent, of course. Of course. The researcher in me is like, ah, where can people read about this? I had no idea. I'm not, mm-hmm. to, I'm not surprised, mm-hmm. and yet I'm appalled, and I want to read more. Yeah, I think it's been published in the Washington Post. Okay. It, you know, Rewire News, it. which is... A favorite outlet of mine mm-hmm. has a lot of um, amazing uh, articles um, about uh, the Department of Homeland Security, ICE, and atrocities that are happening there, not to mention the increased number of miscarriages that have taken place while people are in custody. So I think when we talk about like the full history of it all, mm-hmm. um, we get a, a better understanding of just how much um, government policy tinkers in um, and does horrible things when it steps in between people and their right to reproductive health care. But it's also helps us understand why people might be a little cautious. You know, people in my family, um, which is my mother's family is originally from Mississippi, mm-hmm. have every right to be cautious and leery of, 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 you know, lefties who are saying, well, this is for your good. When, you know, that state has a history of eugenics, it has a history of Mississippi appendectomies where people went in to have children and came out um, with a hysterectomy without consent. Um, so I think we have yet to reconcile or, or, or have some sort of, of uh, acknowledgement of the fact that, um, that the history of this country can very well be understood and navigated through who, who is being given the right in the privilege of making decisions about their body and who is having those rights denied. Mm -hmm. And and that's something that I think as folks are talking about abortion rights today, given all of the different bills that are happening, Mm -hmm. right. Is that they forget that it's not just about the right. It's about the access. Right. And it's, it's not just about the access to an abortion. It's about larger reproductive justice Mm -hmm. and, and understanding how these are all connected. And I do think that there's the like the political legal side of things where where you can see that slowly uh, the with the Supreme Court and the shifting of balance that there might be a push 
to to challenge Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. But even without that, we have states passing these bills. Mm -hmm. Even without that, we have states where they've made it so difficult for abortion clinics to even operate Mm -hmm. that we virtually don't have access. Even if we have a a sliver of a right, we don't have access. And so I want I really appreciate you sharing the larger vision of reproductive justice and some of the history so that folks can understand. Yeah, it we do need to have direct action and make sure we're our voices are heard so that Mm -hmm. that there isn't further chipping away. But like you said, you all were clear four years ago. We were losing. Exactly. We've been losing. Exactly. And and I want to circle back to something you mentioned. You mentioned the disparities in people being uh, prosecuted for Mm -hmm. Uh, miscarriages Mm -hmm. and self-administered or um, self-managed, self-managed abortions and the disparities there. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, for me, the idea of self-managed abortions, I I guess I knew, but I I didn't know that language, right, Mm -hmm. in terms of people being able to access pills and and do that at home. Can you talk a little bit about self-managed abortions and the disparities in who's getting Persecuted for it. Of course. Or prosecuted. Yeah. Prosecuted, persecuted. Both, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> um, so we have a, we are on our second year of a self-managed abortion um, campaign that is uh, trying to educate the public about self-managed abortion with pills. And um, we also recently launched Stop Prosecuting Abortion, which is specifically calling out the pro-life movement on the fact that many of their leaders openly discuss how they want to prosecute people for self-managing their abortions. The logical consequence of abortion bans is women and people who experience pregnancy going to jail. And when, when you look at recent bans, they always talk about the abortion provider. When you self-manage your abortion, then the, the person who is pregnant is the provider. So the idea that people are not going to go to jail and uh, for their pregnancy outcomes is ridiculous. And there's already um, a lot of settled law, um, national advocates, or not settled law, but examples of this happening in, in states all over the country. National Advocates for Pregnant Women, which is a wonderful partner that we work with in Wisconsin, um, but they are a national organization full of awesome lawyers who come into states like Missouri and defend people who are being prosecuted for manslaughter because they had a miscarriage and they drink alcohol. Um, So people who are being punished for addiction or drug use. Um, People in Wisconsin, for example, we have a campaign um, about around Act 292, which has been on the books since the 90s. This is one of those um, cocaine, crack mom, crack baby um, uh, fear laws that right. just has never properly been taken out of use. And thousands of people have been referred to the state for investigation because they had the audacity to go to their doctor and say, I've used drugs in the past. So not only does this law um, make people who are pregnant not want to tell the truth to their health care provider at a moment when it's critical that they do, but it, it puts people in the position of facing criminal penalty for a pregnancy outcome over a health issue, which is ridiculous. And it makes grown people be, have to go through the juvenile court system because it, the law allows for them to appoint a lawyer for the fetus and does not require that they give the grown person Hey, lawyer. So you are in juvenile court without a lawyer, with with all of the privacy for people who aren't aware. Juvenile court proceedings um, are or juvenile uh, child protection proceedings are incredibly private. So you can't talk about them. Nobody's talking about them. The press isn't talking about them. We have uh, we have I personally talked to and met people who've been caught up in this. And it devastates lives. People have their children taken from them. And we, that is not the only state. That's the, wor- that's the most extreme law that we found. But it's not the only state where this is happening. And in Missouri, where, we, where I live, um, folks have been caught up in the criminal system because um, people are being penalized for their pregnancy outcomes. 
It's just a fact. So I think a lot of folks aren't aware of that. And part of us educating people about self-managed abortion is to lay that groundwork that already in this country, people are being um, viewed through a criminal justice lens for um, pregnancy outcomes, for miscarriage and um, or stillbirth and, and other outcomes. When you layer onto that the lack of access to abortion services, um, what, what you end up getting is this back and forth concern, which is that people need to understand um, what their rights are and understand that abortion is still legal in, in every state in the union. But they also need to understand um, that with all of the abortion deserts we have, where we have multiple states where there aren't providers um, or where there's restrictions that make it hard to get access, that the odds are that people are more and more likely to self-manage. So what are your rights? Um, how, is, how does the World Health Organization um, uh, give advice to, do the, to self-manage safely? Um, and also, what does the landscape look like in a post-real world? And what, what are the, the people who are orchestrating this post-real world? Um, what is their intent? So we have spent um, a lot of time, at least two years, <laughs> if not more, um, capturing uh, pro-life activists and leaders on tape. And asking them the basic question of should women go to jail for self-managing their own abortion? And we have those tapes on our website under the Stop Prosecuting Abortion campaign page. And uh, shockingly, um, people talking openly about, of course, they should go to jail. We've had pro-life leaders say that they that people should face a death penalty. We've had pro-life leaders say that people should um, uh, be prosecuted for murder. And, you know, it's, I think it's very important that we understand what their motivation and what that they know the end goal, even if, if a lot of people are waking up to the reality of, of what we see in the future. Yeah. So for folks who are waking up, Mm -hmm. what do they need to do? What do they need to know? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, as I said, um, for folks who are waking up, they need to know that um, abortion is legal in 50 states right now. They also need to know that uh, Roe is in peril and uh, in in all likelihood, the only person in this entire country who can determine whether or not Roe v. Wade stands or falls is uh, Chief Justice Roberts. He is absolutely anti-abortion, but he's also somebody who is somewhat political, and even though the courts are not supposed to be. And he's also somebody who is concerned about the legacy, the historic legacy of his tenure on, on the court. So um, it's not a matter of if so much as when he will get um, a challenge that he likes and that provides him uh, the proper Um, format in which to gut row. Um, We don't expect abortion to be struck down 100%, um, but a gutting of row would would kick it back to the states with 20 plus states having an automatic trigger to ban abortion. um, And that includes my home state of Missouri. So people need to understand that that we, um, abortion rights advocates and reproductive justice advocates, we're not being hysterical <laughs> when when we said that, that the Supreme Court was on the line. It was. Um, we were right about the fact that Kavanaugh um, is nightmarish. Um, people need to know that when you when whenever I hear people say something's unconstitutional as a black woman, I kind of want to shake them because the reality is that uh everything is is constitutional or unconstitutional based upon the Supreme Court. That's their sole role is to determine um, and interpret the constitutionality of law. Yep. So so is it unconstitutional? We're going to see. Um, and and that's why people challenge things up to the court. So unconstitutionality is not our friend. And 
Donald Trump has spent the last year stacking federal courts for this very purpose. Um, the flip side of all that dire and doom is that people need to know that we are on the right side of justice, that my response to uh, Missouri recently passing an abortion ban is defiance, that I absolutely 110 percent am committed to increasing access to abortion and advancing reproductive justice. And I don't give a damn what the state thinks um, it is going to do. We as activists are going to fight and we are going to fight because abortion and reproductive health care are absolutely critical to people being able to be successful selfishly as somebody who lives in Missouri. I want I want to live in a community that's thriving and that can't happen if people can't plan their their reproductive health. Yeah. Um, so we are committed. There's direct action that is happening all over the country. And yes, even in Missouri. Um, we are doing public forums on self-managed abortion with pills. Um, there are wonderful lawyers that are working to tear down restrictions to access um, abortion pills. Uh, and, and, you know, this isn't the fight uh, we wanted. It's certainly a fight I would have preferred to avoid. But this is a fight that my organization and activists in the reproductive justice movement have been preparing for since November of 2016. And if folks want to fight with you or uh, fund the organizations, not just Reaper Action, but other organizations as well, how can they do that? Great question. So um, Repro Action would love their money. <laughs> I bet. So Repro Action um, has an online donation uh, tab at reproaction.org. I highly recommend that people um, also join our email list so they can find out about ways to take action. Um, and you can do that on our website as well, reproaction.org. Um, I, I can't say enough about what the critical role that abortion funds play in um, helping people access care. I have been a volunteer who has participated in the work of abortion funds, and they, are, they provide tremendous support from transportation to helping to cover the costs of procedures to connecting with counseling. And it's just amazing. So there are the, there's a national network of abortion funds. Um, if people are listening to this and are not sure whether their state has a fund, they probably do. And you can access it there. Um, for Missourians, we have the Gateway Women's Access Fund and they are amazing, wonderful, all volunteer organization and um, very much so uh, need funding because now the demand is only getting higher and people um, in states like Missouri, where we have a 72 hour mandatory waiting period um, and no exceptions, this is before the ban, um, there is an incredible need for people to get transportation and be able to come from all over the country, all over the Midwest, to St. Louis um, or to uh, to Hope Clinic in Illinois right across the river. And that that requires money. So hotel stays and we don't want people sleeping in their cars. Um, so I, I cannot recommend enough that people fund the funds. And they are uh, in, in just one final thing I want to add, which is for people who are newly outraged, um, I want them to understand and appreciate that there, there's been 40 plus years of activism. And if you think of it, somebody might most likely already be doing it. So if, if you feel like there's a need, um, just be sure to check because there's, there's no be benefit to recreating the wheel. Um, and that folks need to know that, like, oh, we need to provide funding for abortions. There's a fund for that. There's already amazing networks that have uh, tremendous activists um, and seasoned uh, leadership, and we need to trust that leadership and respect it and support it rather than trying to create some other version of it. Yeah. Um, and so I, I urge people who have a natural tendency to organize um, to follow my favorite uh, component of organizing, which is str be strategic. 
Um, and one of the most efficient strategic things we can do is look for um, places where we can we can join up with existing work. And then if you identify something that's not happening, go do it. Right. But to look for coalition building opportunities, like you said, to be strategic is more powerful. Oh, yes. Right. Yes. Like I know that I am not seeped in this world. And so I'm really appreciative that when I reach out, you said, yes, you'd be willing to talk and and just even preparing and reading about Reaper Action and other organizations. It's it's absolutely amazing the amount of work and the resources that you have on the website. And so I encourage people to check it out. Um, and I encourage people to, to give, become members of the network, the national network abortion funds. Mm -hmm. You can be a member and just have a standing donation that goes to the organization uh, to find ways to, to volunteer. Um, but to know that people have been seeped in this work and doing this work for years. Mm -hmm. And so as your outrage and and there were times where you're talking where I was just aghast, right? Like as your eyes get opened, you know, take that energy and find a way to connect with those who are doing the work. So I so appreciate you taking the time to come. I, I, I know that sometimes when things are in the headlines and hot, right? Like you're, you almost feel like you're repeating the same thing over and over. You've done this so many times. And so I appreciate you sharing with us. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah. And thank you for joining us on Raising Equity. Hopefully you'll learn something. You're going to go dig into some more information. But my hope is that you have a, a larger understanding and appreciation for the discussion about abortion rights that's happening now and understand how it's bigger than that and and look for a way that you can connect with these issues because it is absolutely connected to broader issues and important issues of reproductive justice in our country and racial and economic justice. So thanks for joining us on Raising Equity.